Chapter 9 Legends of the Sorcerers We saw with our own eyes one of these people making the image of a person to bewitch. A demon comes out of his mouth, many evil spirits come down, and the victim is attacked by the specified evil. Ibn Khaldun, Mukadama, 14th century. The Mystery of El Arab The nomadic Arabs of the Hejaz today are anything but a superstitious people. The rigid and unimaginative impact of puritanical Wahhabism, as preached under the present regime, leaves little room for anything other than a strictly literal interpretation of life. The one exception that I found there, during over a year of recent wanderings, was the story of El Arab. El Arab was, it seems, either a great fraud, a great magician, or the first man to make use of electricity. Three or four hundred years ago he appeared in the form of a wandering anchorite and sought refuge in a small village. Following a dispute during which his interpretations of theology seemed too liberal to the local residents, he was driven forth into the wilderness. It seemed, however, that El Arab had taken a liking to the spot. From the sand dunes about a mile away, he is said to have directed long lightning flashes at the unhappy inhabitants, until they, rather unwillingly, invited him to take up his residence among them. There were no more religious discourses. Instead, El Arab, the Arab, that was the only name he would give, spent his time demonstrating his lightning and enlarging upon his theories. According to his teaching, Lightning, like everything else, had its real uses. Things which were not put to a use were simply being wasted. He, El Arab, had learned how to master it and to bend it to his will. When he was charged with sorcery, he merely laughed. He used to demonstrate to travel as the lightning, imprisoned, as he said, in clay jars. Very little more is known of his activities except this. When anyone was anxious of news from some far place, El Arab would slightly open one jar and call upon the lightning to bring back tidings, aiming it in the general direction of the desired news. There would be a puff of smoke, a sharp crack, and lightning would fork forth from the vessel. Then he would open another jar, into which the lightning, swifter than light, had returned, and behold, within would be seen a green glow. This El Arab would interpret and give the desired information, which always turned out to be true. In his normal life there seemed nothing at all odd, and the strangest thing was that travellers used to follow the light when lost in the desert and reach the village in safety. When he died, El Arab was said to have lived in the settlement for nearly 250 years. Small wonder that generations had grown up regarding him as nothing extraordinary, lightning and all. But there was a rude shock when he died. As is customary when a revered man dies, his body was buried on the spot, under the desert sands in a dune near the village well. When the mourners returned to their village, it was seen that El Arab's house had disappeared. This phenomenon had not only never been seen by the local people, but they had never even heard of such a thing. And so it is still talked about. As one man said to me, it may seem strange, but again there has only been one El Arab. Had there been two, it is likely that the second would have departed in the same way. From a scientific point of view, Several things strike the student of oriental tales about magicians. It comes, first of all, as something of a shock to note that so very little has been done in sifting the magical lore of the East to ascertain, where possible, fact from fancy. In many cases there seems to be an underlying stratum of truth in these stories, particularly those concerning individual magicians. This does not necessarily mean that they are entirely true. It does mean that there is still much to be learned from Oriental magic. 
reading accounts of reputed sorcerers and talking to the people among whom they have lived, one is driven to the conclusion that, in general, the people of the East are not more easily deceived than those of other lands. In the tale just quoted, for example, the Arabs who retail it are not content with marvelling at the seeming miracles of El Arab. History has shown them to be an essentially practical race. Hence, as would be expected, they are more interested in how he gained his power and whether it can be duplicated. This, it will be observed, is the essence of the scientific rather than the philosophical attitude. Naturally, the Arabs of that area lack even the basic scientific knowledge to carry speculation beyond semi-medieval scope. It is their attitude, however, which counts. For the purposes of study, therefore, it is interesting to collect these same tales of sorcery. Sodoma of Baghdad A magician greatly in demand in the days of the early caliphs of Baghdad was known as Sodoma. It was his wont to travel miles out into the trackless desert, there to commune with spirits. Many times he came across travellers, seeking water and almost at their last gasp. It is reported that, although he carried no food with him, he was always able by supernatural means to produce water and choice fruits to revive the starvelings. There are several records of this type of wizardry. One such magician, whose food was carried into the desert for him by the magical rock bird, familiar to readers of the Arabian Nights, was able to make stranded travellers eat, even though they were unconscious when found. Other travellers, even today, relate that, having sunk into a stupor through lack of food, they slept. When they awoke, these people claim, it was as though they had seen in a dream the right road home, printed across the desert sands, and their strength had returned. Apart from the legend of Sodoma, it is possible that the subconscious mind was in some way stimulated during the sleep, and that that strange sixth sense which desert people acquire came to their rescue. Emotion of any kind seems often to raise mental powers to a higher pitch. This, at any rate, could be an explanation for many of the phenomena of magic. It is usual to state that the emotion, cupidity and power lust, is what drives man to theurgic acts. Psychologists and historians claim that a slight unbalance of the brain is enough to make a man believe that he can control nature because he wants to do so more than anything else. This theory is as good as any. It is interesting, nevertheless, to note the magical attitude towards the situation. It is only when emotion is roused to a greater than natural pitch, say the magicians, that man is capable of rising above the natural order of things and wreaking his designs upon nature and other men alike. Again, we come here close to semi-religious and frenzy states. This pattern is followed in the local tale of the Atlanko, the Golden River in Tibet. Running into Lake Sing Sule, the stream carries with it particles of alluvial gold, which are trapped in goatskins staked in the waters. But legend has it that a certain Tibetan magician swore that he would gain control of the gold, so that it should be available only to those who were worthy of it. As a result, we are told, a pact was made between the magician and the river god. Now, whenever danger threatens the country, the gold stops coming. It is claimed that during several campaigns with China, this discrepancy in gold was noted both before and after the event. Siltim the Wizard Siltim, an Arab sorcerer, had cultivated the art of taking any form he chose. Falling in love with a beautiful girl who disliked him, his love reached such heights that he retired to a desolate riverine spot to nurse his feelings. After a period of two years, in which he was said to have learned the language of fishes and been able to project his powers far away at will, he discovered how to summon the girl to him in the dead of night. She was aware of visiting him, 
Her stories of her dreams might have been believed, but she held that the magician lived in a wondrous place, whereas it was known that he had nothing more than a hut on the riverside. Relatives became anxious in due time, and one of them travelled to the hermit's hut to charge him with sorcery. This he freely admitted, and stated that he had the power to convert his home into a marble palace. As soon as the visitor returned to report, the girl actually vanished, and so did Siltim. This tale is typical of the emotion concentration element common to very many branches of magic. Many stories have been handed down in the East relating to the search for the elixir of life, by which immortality could be secured. Many of them centre around the heart or the liver, and some are clearly symbolical. The following very popular tale seems to combine philosophical and occult elements, and may be in some way based upon some real occurrence. A wealthy landowner married the daughter of a Persian prince. Soon after the wedding, the husband spent much time away from home, engaged upon pilgrimages. One room in the house remained locked. Although warned never to pry into the secret, the young wife found that her curiosity could not be contained. One day a travelling locksmith called while the husband was away in Syria. He was commissioned to open the door. Excitedly, the lady accompanied him, but to her horror, as he tried the first key, the man collapsed at her feet, uttering terrible shrieks. When the servants ran to their mistress's assistance, the locksmith was found to be dead. On the husband's return, of course, the princess had to admit her guilt. She was then told that he had been engaged upon experiments whereby the panacea of perpetual life might be produced. He had almost succeeded, according to the tests set forth in an ancient manuscript. Only one small part of the experiment remained to be done, yet this unfortunate interruption, as is the case with most magical rites, had rendered all the work null and void. The part of the process which was incomplete was the adding of the heart of a locksmith. But this was not all. A large gash was seen on the left side of the dead man's breast. Inside the locked room, all had been turned to ashes. While the couple stood looking at the devastation, a mocking laugh floated down from the ceiling. The story ends on the melancholy note that the husband went mad, and then the wife, and as each died within a few months of each other, it was found that their hearts had been removed. That is why a house in old Tehran is still called the Mansion of the Three Stolen Hearts. Magicians, especially when they are itinerant cheats, often have an eye to topical matters, as well as playing their part in aiding those suffering from traditional diseases and ambitions. During the last famine in India, a little-known Bombay wizard, whose main theory was that nakedness was akin to godliness, became rich overnight. Charms made by him with Himalayan leopard powder, or so he stated, ensured that their possessor could not be harmed by hunger or disease. Thousands of people did, in fact, die, but not the magician. He could afford to buy black market rice. Neither did one woman who reported his wonders to a certain Maharaja. Nothing was to be done in his state, declared that prince, until the magician had been brought before him. After a considerable amount of persuasion, the sorcerer was placed next to his highness in his court assembly. Every word that he said was taken as gospel. Loaded with honours and possessions, he stuck out until the last against the wearing of clothes. When he was last heard of, his self-esteem had so grown that he would speak only twice a day. Every word was recorded with a pen of gold. California is not the only place where strange cults can spring up. If the reader thinks that Britain too is immune, let him read the boasts of those who claim to teach esoteric Eastern lore and may or may not know anything about it. This story is first-class material for future myths and legends. Unless the magician is discredited, 
it is likely that his exploits will become famous. I have been able to collect interesting material of a vampire legend in the making which seems unusually interesting. There are many tales circulating in India about a certain English vampiress who is said to have eaten raw flesh and to have drunk the blood of humans whenever possible. Is this story true? Is it just another of those blood-curdling tales spread by anti-British agitators, like the Belgian baby's horror of the First World War? The truth is somewhere in between. It forms one of the most classical examples of legend development that I have ever encountered. An English widow, her husband had been killed in 1916, lived in Bombay and spent the hot season in the hills. She is said to have been, outwardly, quite average in appearance. The only thing about her attitude to life that seemed marked was her belief that she was irresistible to the opposite sex. Even that is not unknown. A Maharaja who was staying one year at the same hill station was in the habit of giving magnificent parties. One night, after one such entertainment, this woman, Mrs. W, and a friend, Mrs. S, were travelling home in a rickshaw. The rickshaw in front of them was upset against some rocks, having taken a corner too fast. Several people were injured. The two women stopped their rickshaw and went to see if they could be of any help. Neither of them, be it noted, was involved in the accident or hurt in any way. When they got back to their hotel, Mrs. S noticed that her companion's mouth was covered in blood. Later, the story circulated that Mrs. W had been sucking the blood of one of the victims of the accident. She was a vampire. She died some months later, and hence the legend has grown and will probably continue to grow. By chance, however, I was able to meet Mrs. S and ask her what she knew about the whole thing. Here is her story. I asked Mrs. W that very night why there was blood on her face. At first she said that it came from one of the victims and that it had got on her face by accident. Three days later, however, when the rumour was going round that she was a vampire, repeated by some of the survivors of the crash and not by me, she came to me to make a confession and said that she was going to return to England for treatment. I asked her if she was a vampire and she said that she was not. The truth was that, when a child, she had suffered from some illness which made it necessary for her to eat raw meat sandwiches. She became so used to them that she could never eat cooked meat. Her doctor regarded this as more or less harmless and a psychological state. So the diet was continued. When she went to India, she found that it was difficult to get raw meat, though she had a great longing for it, and in the end managed to arrange a supply. But she used to ration herself as much as possible. On the night of the crash, she said she had not had any for weeks, and the sight of the thing as she bent over the injured man was too much for her, so she touched her face to his, as if to kiss him. An Indian present, who may have known about her liking for red meat, started the rumour. Human vampirism, therefore, if it has ever existed, might be ascribed to a psychosis, or an appetite engendered by conditioning to raw meat. That raw meat has been eaten by man is well known, a relatively recent survival of this practice is contained in the accounts of the famous Scottish man-eater Sawney Bean and his family. There may be certain main principles involved in magic. There certainly is no clear unanimity among magicians as to the reason for the use of symbolic words, devices and writings. Probably still alive and doing a remunerative business is a certain Tibetan holy man, he repudiated the title of Lama with some contempt, who sold, for the equivalent of five shillings, a scroll for the purification of the soul. This, he said, is essential before anyone can become fully human, let alone be able to study or appreciate the wonders of magic. Celebrated as a sorcerer, he would not talk of his spells and denied that he was 305 years old. Listen not to what people say about me, he said. 
for I am not only not over a hundred years of age, I am not yet born. The scroll, of which I have one, consisted of bleached leaves, which had to be worn for several days before being written on by the wizard. This ensured the penetration of the scroll by the aura, and guided his hand. I had to stand behind him for about fifteen minutes to have my scroll completed. During this time he kept up a constant flow of conversation with someone who was a city dweller four days' march from here, and somewhat indistinct owing, no doubt, to high winds. The finished work was wrapped in a piece of dried skin and tied with gut. When I brought it back to England, it was useful as a barometer because the gut invariably became damp four hours or so before rain. The holy man told the writer that the paraphernalia of magicians, especially those who foretold the future, were all so much window dressing only to impress those who demand such things, and I have heard this is also so in the West. He stated that the only genuine costume for a magician was such as he himself wore, and he begged me to take to it without delay, so that I would feel the beneficial influence which would thenceforward guide my life. On his head was a pancake-type hat of snow-leopard fur, no longer snowy, and in his ears great unpolished lumps of amber. A long, heavy string of similar lumps interspersed with pieces of rough jade hung around his neck, over a dirty, yellow, fur-lined coat, which reached to the ankles. From his waist hung a large green skin bag, embroidered in the same colour, and dotted with red glass beads. A deep leather fringe completed this. On his feet were a pair of embroidered, turned-up toe slippers, tied securely with gut. His winter boots were suspended around his neck. He refused to part with the jade and amber rings on his fingers. These, he said, were his luck, and destroyed such things as mountain demons, various kinds of enemies, and the werewolves who attacked travellers. His last words to me were a warning against washing the body. The hands may be washed, but the body never. In this, at least, he seemed to be a devoted follower of his belief. There are many stories current in Egypt about magicians of the Middle Ages and their attempts to find the elixir of life or the philosopher's stone. One of the most interesting of these was told me in Cairo, and I noted it not for its plot so much as for certain elements therein. Scattered among Arabic and Persian alchemical and magical writings, there are references to the golden head, and yet never an indication as to what this was. Here I found a definite reference to it at last. A famous Kyrene sorcerer, El Gerbi, concentrated his activities upon the finding of hidden treasure. To this end, he learned, by means of an old man's advice, how to transmute clay to gold. This, however, could be done only once. When transmuted, the head became an oracle or possessed by a spirit. One of its powers was to declare where hidden treasures could be found. It seems that El Gerbi had already used the head for ordinary divination and that it had given oracles as to many and strange things. Sure enough, once transmuted, the head began to speak though its eyes and lips moved not at all, and gave him minute directions as to where the first treasure was to be sought. When he had brought this back to his house, El Gerbi again consulted his oracle. According to the testament which it is claimed he left behind, the head refused to tell him of more than one treasure a month. He composed himself to wait, but again the head cheated. It told him about a treasure, vaster than man could even imagine, but it was sunk 800 feet below the bottom of the sea. In the ensuing altercation, the head threw a jar at El Gerbi's head, which smashed itself in the street and attracted neighbouring attention. This passed off quietly enough, but the quarrels between the spirit of the head and the magician became more and more frequent. It was generally assumed in the locality that the man was mad, 
One day, when a certain inoffensive jeweller was passing, a particularly large jar flew through the window of the Gerby mansion, striking the jeweller on his neck. The matter came to court. In his defence, the magician denied the charge of assault and explained about the head. He was sentenced to six months jail. When he returned home, the head seemed better behaved. It advised him to make the elixir of life and even supplied full details of the ingredients and method. Before long, word came to the magistrate who had sentenced the sage. As a man in his seventies, this was a discovery that he could not afford to ignore. In return for a free pardon and a document explaining that El Gerbi was sane and blameless, a file of the precious medicine changed hands. That same night, the head addressed the sorcerer. I have just heard that the magistrate has taken the potion. This means that he will have at least sixty more years of life. But I forgot to tell you that they are your years. You will die in the morning as soon as the magistrate's elixir begins to act. It is said that El Gerbi had hardly time to write out a confession of the whole affair and throw the head into the Nile before death overcame him.